Okay. So I'm not going to ask you what you wrote down, although I am going to ask you to leave your cards on that wooden <laughs> piece. Okay? You didn't know that you were human subjects in a little experiment of mine. But I'm going to guess that the things that you wrote down on list number one were not all positive. Okay. So what I want to talk to you about today is the fact that there's a revolution happening in higher education. And if most of what you know comes from reading newspapers or listening to radio shows, you might not know that. And I think it's pretty important to understand what's happening in higher education in this country and around the world. So if you believe everything you hear about higher education right now, particularly if it's coming from Washington, D.C., where I just was, you could be forgiven for thinking that our college education is losing value, that in particular it's not giving you value for money, that we're very fuzzy on what we want students to be learning and on whether they're learning anything at all. You could be forgiven for missing the revolution in learning specifically that's unfolding at our nation's colleges and universities. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about this revolution. And I also want to talk to you a little bit about the genuinely unique place that UCSC has in the history of higher ed in the United States and how that's linked to the revolution in learning that's happening elsewhere now. In fact, I will argue that from the very moment of its founding, UCSC anticipated the revolution that's happening right now, that it has the spirit of educational innovation in its DNA. And I even have some nicely placed quotations to prove that, using evidence to support my argument. So first, the claim that there's a revolution happening in higher ed and that it's the first such revolution in 150 years. So you might say that we've had major upheavals in colleges in the, in the intervening 150 years. We've had the free speech movement in the 60s, and we've had the culture wars of the 80s, to name just two. And I would say that these were indeed revolutions. But these revolutions dealt with the politics of campus life, the role of the university, and the content of what we teach. Okay. And these were crucially important transformations. But what distinguishes the current moment is that what we are talking about now is not what we teach, but how we teach. And that has not happened since 1860. Okay. In fact, very little has changed in how we teach and learn in colleges in this country and around the world for the most part since 1860. So the year 1860 is when Charles Eliot became the youngest ever president of Harvard University and teamed up with the leading industrialists of his age to kick off the first major revolution in U.S. higher education. His friends and associates were people like Rockefeller, Frederick Taylor, and see if these names ring any bells to you. Carnegie, Stanford, Duke, Cornell, and Vanderbilt. So these titans of the industrial age endowed schools financed buildings, and used their wealth to completely transform the meaning, value, and practice of higher education, and in fact, of education as a whole in this country. This was a revolution from above, finely tuned to the needs of an industrial economy. This revolution brought you grades. None of these things had previously existed. Grades, standardized tests, credit hours, IQ tests, graduate schools, professional schools, majors, departments, academic specialization by professors, and academic specialization by students. This revolution brought you a, the college as a selective institution that further sorts students by disciplines, majors, and GPAs. The college as a giant sorting machine, or as I like to think of it, a temple of disintegration. This is not a good model for a world in flux. It is not a good model for a world that is connected, and it is definitely not a good model for a world that is breaking boundaries 
in knowledge and practice in order to move forward. So there's a revolution happening in higher ed and not a moment too soon. But here's the funny thing. The same revolution was uncannily foretold some 54 years ago when Clark Kerr and the regents of the University of California decided to try out a bold educational experiment on the old cow ranch in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Clark Kerr called it, quote, the most significant educational experiment in the history of the University of California. And at that time, that was not such a huge claim. The three hottest topics in higher education today, no majors, no departments, no grades. Okay, any of you who know anything about the University of California at Santa Cruz will know that we've been doing those things from day one. Okay. The other hottest topic in higher education is the renewal of the teaching mission of our universities and the shift to a culture of learning to really thinking about how students learn and making sure that they have an opportunity to do that learning. So it's the balancing, particularly at Research One universities like UCSC, of outstanding research and student teaching. UCSC was specifically designed to strike that balance. The first UCSC Chancellor, Dean McHenry, made clear that at UCSC, quote, it is just that much more difficult to forget that the students are individual, unexchangeable, irreplaceable human beings. Okay, individual, unexchangeable, ir sorry, individual, unexchangeable, irreplaceable human beings. That experiment did not go unnoticed. In 1967, a guy named Nevitt Sanford wrote a book, pretty much of a bestseller at the time, called Where Colleges Fail. And in that book, he wrote, some efforts are already being made to improve teaching. The whole design for the Santa Cruz campus of the University of California is an attempt to create a climate in which teachers will become interested in students and will have an opportunity to really teach them. So two years into its existence, UCSC was being singled out as a departure in higher ed. It took another 50 years for some other people to wake up to the fact that they might need to think about changing their practice. So I submit to you that UCSC is the only public research one university in the world that was also founded as an experimental school. And that it has been the only, it has persisted in being the only university of that kind in this country until quite recently. Okay. So about 10 years after the campus was started, a bunch of faculty got together and they started a newspaper by the faculty for the faculty called Teacher on the Hill. And I have become completely obsessed with this recently rediscovered archive I will resist the temptation to quote at length from it, except this one time. So the guy who started it was a guy named Frank Adams, taught chemistry. Frank Adams said this, there are many reasons that might have lured us, the faculty, here. I love that the faculty are speaking to the faculty about teaching. They're, I don't know how they found the time. They're writing a whole newspaper about it. He says, the monolithic, dis so why did we come here and why do we stay here? He says, the monolithic disciplinary departments of most institutions might not be the divinely ordained structure for organizing intellectual growth. Pseudo-objective letter grades as major rewards for students might distort the educational process. He went on, there was a pull in the Santa Cruz dream, a campus of a great state university pledged to take teaching, even of undergraduates, seriously. And then he wrote, we're a, if not the fount of educational innovation in American higher education. Okay. It's a pretty big claim. So that was the first decade at UCSC. Fast forward to the present, we've gone from 650 to 20,000 students. In 20 years, we've gone from being a two-thirds white institution to a two-thirds non-white institution, thereby actually representing the state of California.
At this moment in time, we are 42% of our students who are the first in their family to go to college. Okay, we have grades and we have departments and we have majors, although not for long if I have anything to do with it. But I would argue we are still fundamentally a student-centered and profoundly innovative place. So in order to tell you about that, I need to step back and talk a little bit about the changes happening at a larger scale in US higher education. And then I'm gonna zero in on some of what's happening at UCSC right now. So I told you earlier that there was a revolution happening in higher education. And this revolution has been called a learner revolution. It's a revolution not in what we teach, but in how we teach. Institutions of higher education, including Research One universities like ours, are devoting vast attention and resources, in a way most have never done, to reconsidering the following five things. What our students are learning, how they are learning it, how we measure whether they are learning it, who learns and who doesn't under the current system, and how that learning does or does not set them up not only with what is called career readiness, but with what I call life readiness, okay? So we're really thinking about learning in all of these ways. We have a newfound interest nationwide in educational equity and educational accountability, okay? That has sharply refocused attention on the practice of teaching and learning in higher education. Until recently, you couldn't teach kindergarten in this country without some training as a teacher, but you could teach college. So we are bringing cognitive science, social and behavioral science, and data science to bear on making sure that the students that we teach now are learning and that they're learning what they want to learn and what is our best guess that they need to learn in order to be able to cope with a world in flux. And this means training our graduate students and supporting our faculty to teach the students we have now with the tools that we have now. So two and a half years ago, I was asked to found a teaching and learning center at UCSC, and I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A. That's not what I'm really here to talk about tonight, because we're really here to talk about the students, right? Not about the teachers. But the most amazing thing about this experience for me is that it has allowed me after 20 years at UCSC to slowly uncover week by week the profoundly innovative educational projects being undertaken by my colleagues across the university, one of which you're gonna hear about in a moment, as well as to study the long history of innovation at UCSC from the start. Okay. It does make me full of slug pride when I see first how many of these projects exemplify the recommendations coming out in the latest literature for the best ways to encourage student engagement, success, and preparation for the world that we live in, okay? And other institutions are discovering these and scrambling to incorporate them, and we're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and, okay, it also is very exciting to me to see how many of them build on the great tradition of radical learning and educational experimentation at UCSC while remaining responsive to the demands of the students of the state of California today. So let me give you examples, and then I'm gonna turn it over to my friends. There is a much discussed list that some of you may have heard of, of what are called high impact practices, or practices for deep learning, that every college campus in America is scrambling to bring on board. These are practices that are known to help support student learning. Okay. And the list of these high impact practices looks almost like a checklist of the founding vision at UCSC. Number one, common intellectual experiences. Hello, colleges. Okay. Number two, first year seminars and experiences. Hello, college core courses and college one. Undergraduate research, okay? For many years when I was first at UCSC, there was a banner that you saw when you drove onto campus that said an uncommon commitment to undergraduate research. And it always bothered the heck out of me because it was hung from a bridge right outside of graduate student housing. <laughs> and I thought, and I asked the chancellor this once at the time, the old chancellor at the time, 
at dinner. I said, what do you think it's like coming home from the supermarket as a UCSC graduate student and driving under a banner that says an uncommon commitment to, to undergraduate research? Okay, another one. Big questions that matter beyond the classroom. We're pretty into those. And then service learning, community-based learning, field learning, inquiry-based learning, applied learning, and internships. Any of you who know anything about the history or present of UCSC know that these are the kinds of things that we have been at all along. In 1962, three years before the campus was even founded, Ansel Adams visited what would become the campus and wrote the following. I know we cannot put thousands of students in arboreal classrooms, or could we? But we can at least give these students a unique perspective into the world from which they came. We can also produce a special condition of beauty and, if you will, of spiritual therapy. Now, any of you who's ever visited our campus can speak to the spiritual therapy but let's talk about those arboreal classrooms. The University of California, as some of you may know, has 39 natural reserves. And the University of, San the University of California Santa Cruz campus is one of those reserves. So our entire campus is a natural reserve. In the environmental studies department each year, 100 students do forest ecology research as interns on the UCSC forest ecology research plot. That is, they spend six hours a week doing research across 40 acres of trees and shrubs that is then compared with forests all over the world where similar research is being done, primarily to measure the impact of climate change. Students learn science practices like data collection and organization and the fundamentals of field research. This year, in the mandatory transition to the upper division in environmental studies, 250 students at the same time on the same day split into 22 research teams. And they drew this transect from the coastal campus down by the ocean all the way up through the gorges, through the campus to the arboreal forest above the UCSC campus. They split that into 22 research plots and the students went out, collected data about plant, insect, and bird diversity and environmental data about temperature and humidity, organized it into a single data set, and then generated questions and tested hypotheses based on that data set for the next few weeks of the class. At UCSC, we understand that engaging in environmental fields may pose cultural and economic hurdles for students long underrepresented in environmental fields. Field-based research may not appeal to or be feasible for low-income students or students of color from urban backgrounds. So we have a professor who's won a big grant from the Howard Hughes Memorial Institute to make pro projects like Camino. Okay, this is a field-based pathway through the major in ecology and evolutionary biology. So your whole time is field-based that reduces barriers for engaging in field-based learning for first generation and students of color. Camino links introductory courses in field research with scholarships for, under, un, for, with scholarships for upper division field courses that can carry extra fees. As a capto, capstone experience, the Camino students might get to do paid research institute in, internships, professional development, or have opportunities for community-based research and events. Community-based research and scholarship have been an integral part of the UCSC ethos from the very beginning. The Community Studies Program, started in 1969, is the oldest interdisciplinary program at UCSC. It focused on social justice and blended classroom learning with extended field study and internships. Today, the spirit of community of studies lives on in colleges nine and 10 in the only colleges linked to an academic division. They're linked to the social science division. Colleges nine and 10 sponsor two projects I thought I could mention. One is called HACER, the Apprenticeship in Community Engaged Research. Students work with local schools, such as Calabasas Elementary and Watsonville High, to engage in internships, curricular development, research projects, and alternative spring break. And then in one that I find particularly heart-stopping, mind-blowing, 
everything bending. These colleges also sponsor a new class called Transcommunal Peacemaking in partnership with Barrios Unidos, which was founded by a UCSC alum. Undergrads travel to Soledad Correctional Facility to learn from and with a group of men, the Semenawak One World Cultural Group, who have been incarcerated for decades yet have committed themselves to Kingian nonviolence and the collective practices of Iroquois peacemaking. I could go on. Micro internships that drop undergrads in community organizations to help with a project of data analysis or data visualization. Cruise hacks in which 600 hackers turn their visions for social change into tangible projects over a 36 hour period. And then as Keith suggested, the serious games program that develops adaptive, adaptive technologies and promotes health and well-being for the ultra-abled and the elderly through video games and apps. UCSA may not any longer be the fount of educational innovation in the United States of America, but I think this is a good thing. Many institutions have taken up and are committing themselves to practices we have been engaged in for decades. Whether sequencing the genome, tackling cancer with big data, turning out undergraduate creative writers who win prize after prize after prize, or intersectional feminist theorists creating social documentaries, solving climate change, or populating the field with environmental activists, scholars, and scientists who come from the communities and nations hardest hit by climate change. UCSC has been from the start and remains a research powerhouse. I actually didn't know that Keith was going to say research powerhouse, so that kind of made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. UCSC has been from the start and remains a research power, powerhouse fully committed to never forgetting that each student is an individual, unexchangeable, irreplaceable human being. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Uh, we're going to do a Q&A after our next speakers uh, towards the end of the program. So um, <clears throat> our next speakers are perfect examples of great teaching and experiential learning. Alan Christie, first, is a professor of history and the provost of Cowell College, the first of 10 colleges established at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, for those of you who are new to the college system, the college is for each student's intellectual and the college is the intellectual and social center for each student, a vibrant living and learning community. Um, and each is led by a provost who's the academic head of the college. Joining Alan is Nirupama, who is a third year Cowell student studying history and creative writing. She's a great example of seizing the many opportunities open to all UC Santa Cruz students. She is part of the Cowell, Scho uh, College, the Cowell College Scholars Program and has been part of the Chancellor's Undergraduate Internship Program. Please welcome Nirupama and Alan, student and teacher collaborators and explorers. Thank you. Thank you. We had this, I don't know if you were supposed to have this slide at some point in time. Oh, I know, turn it on. There you go. <laughs> it is on, oh. There we go. All right. Oop, no. Did I go back? I went too far. Okay, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm one of the, uh, the co-founders of the Digital Humanities Initiative, by the way, so just so you know that I've got this technology down. <laughs> uh, thank you, Keith, and thank you, Jody. That was, that was wonderful. Jody and I came in around the same time, so you're seeing a generation, a particular generation of, of teachers have come through. We both came in in the mid-90s, correct? Um, and I remember from the very first days, uh, Jody, so it's been a long um, career together and very um, happy to have had it. And uh, uh, Nirupama and I are here to talk about a project that we're doing together that is uh, really exciting and um, kind of bold and audacious. And I want to say before uh, we go on that we have a lot of students, uh, a number of students who are engaged in the project now or who have been engaged in the project in the past in the, in the room right now. Those of you who are in the project, you want to raise your hands or have been in the project in the past? 
So go ahead and, uh, you know, you can talk with them afterwards as well if you, if, if you don't have a chance to talk with us. But um, I'm Alan Christie, as Keith said, and I teach Japanese history. I'm Nora Palmer, and I am an undergraduate, and I've majored in history and creative writing. Yes. All right, so uh, before we talk about our project for real, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what our project is about. So Okinawa um, is an island um, that is one of the 50 prefectures of Japan, and it's actually four, 600 miles south of Japan, um, which is far closer to Taiwan than it is to Japan. And in fact, the island is so small, you cannot see that on this map, you know. Um, the island is only about 70 miles long, so, you know, you could fit Okinawa twice between the distance from here to San Diego. So you might be asking, why is such a tiny island so important that we've done an entire research project about it? Well, it becomes important because it's the site of the last and most devastating land battle of Okinawa, uh, of World War II even. And um, the Battle of Okinawa sees um, an incredible casualty rate for American soldiers. And it also has... Uh, almost kills one quarter of the civilian population of Okinawa and what they call the Typhoon of Steel. And so this becomes a place that is really central and important to Americans once they win this particular battle because they see it as their way into Japan um, to invade mainland Japan and end the war through there. This plan quickly becomes scuppered when the atomic bombs go off and end the war instead. So Okinawa becomes a place of uncertainty for Americans. What do you do about this tiny island, you know? And the answer becomes pretty clear in 1949 when the Chinese declare themselves communist, and in the 50s when the, when the Koreans are like, hey, we might become communist, we're not sure yet. Um, so this is when America is like, oh, Okinawa becomes incredibly strategically important. It is the keystone of the Pacific, and we are going to settle down here. And that's why Okinawa becomes such an important place to us. This, in fact, is a slide that I got from a Marine captain at Camp Foster on Okinawa when uh, he gave me a PowerPoint presentation about why the United States has bases in Okinawa. So this is uh, an example of military technology today. And as you can see, Okinawa is centrally located to project American power throughout all kinds of key areas uh, in East Asia. But that realization of the importance of Okinawa didn't come immediately. It really did, as Nir Pama say, said, took until uh, the Korean War for it to dawn upon the uh, United States military that this was a place that needed to be fortified as such. So um, that's the context for, for what we're doing. And, and we're going to get back to that question in a minute. But before we do so, I want to say a little bit about um, being a history professor of, of Japanese history uh, and in the midst of being a Japanese historian, having a specialty in this tiny place called Okinawa. Um, because. Uh, a couple things are important here. First, when you're teaching Japanese history in the United States, you're teaching a kind of fantasy story. Uh, many of your students have, haven't had a chance to go there. It's not like teaching US history where you can do field work. You can go to the sites, or you have some kind of familiarity, some reasonable chance of going there. Um, you're always talking about a place that they can access in video, they can access in books, but they can't necessarily ac access in person. Um, and when you think about the importance of of, of, of personal physical access to a place and what that can mean for learning. I think that's a significant thing. And second, Okinawa is one of these places, as Nir Palma was saying, that's so small um, that it often falls outside of the realm of the teachable subject, right? Um, you might talk about it in the context of Japanese history, but it's a marginal place. Uh, it doesn't really come up. And it's often considered too small to be a subject matter of, of a history class on its own right. So while I had done my dissertation with a, a great deal of, of emphasis on Okinawa and, and thought of the place as being crucial both before the war but also since for understanding things in East Asia, it was a subject that I didn't have a lot of opportunity to teach about. But as I was teaching Japanese history, by the way, I'm, I'm the kind of person that Jody described. I went to the University of Chicago for my PhD, which means the first day I was in the classroom at, at uh, Santa Cruz, I thought, wait a minute, no one taught me how to do this. <laughs> and I had to figure it out along the way. And so, of course, what I did was I imitated what I had seen done before me, right? And so you, uh, you have a topic, um, uh, and, and it's sort of content-focused. You want to teach people the history of modern Japan, and you come up with a bunch of books and articles for people to read, and you have lectures. Long and, and expensive. <laughs> yeah, well, they can be expensive. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> when you assign these things, um, 
everybody reads these things and we all have this sort of orientation to this information as if it's the information we're supposed to absorb. We're learning about Japan. But we're on the quarter system, even on the semester system, it's impossible. You can't really learn enough about Japan in those 10 weeks. And as a teacher over the years, you become painfully aware of how, how um, uh, fleeting is the memory of classes that were taken two quarters before, right? It doesn't necessarily stick so well. Um, and so when you're focused a lot on the content of the classes that you're teaching, it's often a very uh, transient experience. And so I was often thinking about what's the thing that we could do to really help students um, learn about the subject matter that I care about uh, and that I think is important in the world. And, and two things really came to mind. One, you have to find a way to make sure that the students have an opportunity to feel an engagement with it, to feel connected to it, to feel like it's, it's theirs. Uh, when I'm teaching about modern Japan and I'm trying to convince them that industrialization is an important topic, if it's not coming from them, it's very, I'm, I'm, I'm pressing it upon them, right? I need to find a way for them to embrace that as their topic as well. Um, and the other thing I need to do is I need them to teach how, I need them to learn how to think about history, to think like historians so that once the class is done, they've got the tools they need to keep learning about the subject matter, to keep being historians. That's the historical skills, that's research, but it's also fundamental uh, attitudes toward asking questions. Um, so when you teach a class, you, you assign these books, and the books are always the res end result of a research process. And sometimes you try to reverse engineer with the students. How did this research process end up to here? What did it look like to put this thing together so that students could see how they could do it themselves? So I decided um, well into my career that the thing to do would be to actually try to reverse this thing. And instead of assigning books that were the end result of research process, start the class with a research process, the end outcome of which I had no idea what it would be. And so I had an opportunity to really try that out with Okinawa, which is a place that I really was looking forward to a few years ago, when uh, the auditor of the University of California, uh, she's the scary person who checks to make sure you're not abusing money. Uh, she was about to retire, and she uh, went to the, um, this is not her, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> she, this is her father. Um, as she was uh, planning her retirement, she went to the director of one of the galleries on campus, uh, the Cessnan Gallery, and she said, I'm about to retire. My father passed away a few years ago, and he was a dentist in his profession, but he was actually a, a very talented amateur photographer. He had gone out on shoots with Ansel Adams, whose name has already come up. And so she said, as I'm, as, as I'm retiring now, I, I wonder if it's possible to do a show of my father's, some of my father's photographs to honor his memory. And she said, of the photographs that he took in his life, and he was at the Monterey Pop Festival taking pictures of Janice and, and uh, Jimmy, but she said the ones that he loved the most were the pictures that he took in Okinawa while he was stationed there uh, during the Korean War in 1953. So she showed these photos to the director of the gallery and said, could we do a show of these? And the director of the gallery looked at these photos and she said, these are really interesting photos. They've got artistic merit. And the question is, do these photos also have any historic merit? Are, there, are they interesting in a historical sense? And so they found me because it, they managed to find a friend of mine who said, oh, Okinawa, that's Alan. Go ask him. <laughs> they brought the photos to me, and I looked through them. I should go back, actually, back to this one. I went through the photos, and uh, there are no historical events in the photos. This is the photo that hit me because I'd written an article about this woman. Well, not this woman but women who did this just about five years before this. So I saw this photo and said, I know what she's doing. I know where she's coming from. I know where she is. I know all about this photo. Um, I also knew that the photos taken in 1953 were taken at a really crucial moment. Because in 1954, after the Korean War was over and the American military had finally decided that Okinawa was a place where they had to develop a major base complex. From 54 to 56, they expanded their appropriation of land from Okinawans by 1,000% to create a much larger military base complex. And so these photos represent the last moment in history that these landscapes and these lifestyles uh, could be seen. And so if we used these photos, we could think about the intensity of transformation in Okinawa from 1945 to the present. This here is a map of the uh, base complex distribution on the main island of Okinawa today. Uh, it covers 11% of this island, again, that, la that uh, measures about 60 to 70 miles. 
Um, 75 percent of the American bases in Japan, which is the largest concentration of bases in the world, are all concentrated in Okinawa. So when we talk about the base complexes in Okinawa, we're talking about a really significant thing. So with that, I thought, this is great. We should uh, do a show of these photos here on campus. But we should use these photos to go to Okinawa and show the photos to people in Okinawa, um, find the places that these photos were shot, and get a measure of what had happened since. So the project has three basic elements. Where were these photos taken? Who are the people in it? And can we produce an exhibit in which it's not just about the photographer, but in which the photographic subjects can speak back to us? Uh, and so that's the, the basic format of the project, with one more thing. Um, I could have done that project by myself. It would have been easy, I suppose. It would have been actually quite boring. Um, I actually thought it would be more successful and be a lot more fun if I did this with undergraduate students. And so I decided that what we would do is I would start with a class, and then I would just begin to recruit students who wanted to work on this Okinawan research project. Mm -hmm. And you know, like, um, it, there's a common misconception, you know, it's like, students doing research, you know, they're going to be like, running around doing paperwork, get me a copy, copy this, do that, you know. Input um, data into the spreadsheet, please. Indeed. Um, but you know, like, the way that research in the humanities works is kind of different to that. That's kind of like, in order to do STEM research, there's kind of a lot of prerequisites. You're building on top of the work of other people, and then you can go on and do something new. But where humanities research kind of differs from that, at least for me, it's been that there's such a value in diversity of experience, diversity of perspective. Everyone can bring something to the table, and everyone can say something that's new and valuable and important. Right. People often, often ask me, well, do the students who participate in this need to be able to read or speak Japanese? And I say, no, that's not really important. It helps at some point along the way, but it's actually not important for the generation of research and for um, its execution. Absolutely. You're a great example. I mean, this is a photo about your story coming into the project. Why don't you tell that? Yeah, sure. So um, I joined this project after seeing Alan at, um, speak at the Cowell College Scholars Program. You know, he was like, this is my project. I do Okinawa stuff. It's awesome. You know? <laughs> I have students I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Alan, uh, was someone that I was really interested in talking to. So I go up to him, and he shows me the girl photos, and we sit down, and they're beautiful, you know? But this one, I had to pause at, because it's just so gorgeous, you know? And the one thing that I noticed is, this is kind of where I'm from. Like, this feels really familiar to me. So I'm obviously, uh, I was born in India, I was raised in Great Britain, um, and I've moved here recently. But in that photo, you can see a doorway, and that's the doorway I would walk through every Sunday night to go to temple. Um, and you see there a depiction of a god. It's a god with four heads and a big old crown. And they're sitting on top of a lotus, and they have a mandala. And these are such like traditionally Hindu things. And I was like, how does India show up in Okinawa? So my research project was really founded by this question of how does my culture manage to somehow find its way into Okinawa, you know? To be honest, when she asked that question, as a Japan scholar, I, I know how Buddhism starts with Hinduism, travels from India through China, gets to Japan. So on the one hand, it's not that surprising a question to me, and it also feels like it's been answered. There's a way in which you know, she'll get to an answer at some point in time and done. But the important thing is that this is Nirupama's question, right? That Nirupama gets to ask this question, and so she starts in on it. You know, and yeah, Alan's kind of right. Like, the particular question of did India make it to Okinawa in... Um, in, in this ancient time from where this pot came from was not particularly productive, you know. I ended up at dead ends, but I was paying attention to a lot of different things about India. What I did find out was really strange. Um, the late 1890s, you know, they're like, there's a bunch of Indians, they come over from North India and they settle in Okinawa. And in the post-war period, you have every tailor is Indian, you know. Every single tailor is Indian in some way, and they even have there's a huge like, peace memorial uh, museum in Okinawa, and they have a reconstruction of what a base town would look like. You know, you wander in there, and it's just like Bombay tailors, and there's a, there's a picture of like, Ganesha on the side, you know? <laughs> and, and, and this is the important thing to me, because on the one hand, when she said, this comes from India, um, I thought, yes, it does come from India, and I also thought I actually hadn't 
been thinking that explicitly about India. Let's see where she'll go with this. And when later on we're in the museum together and she's saying, look, it's Ganesha. I'm thinking, yeah, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> and it was in a really important moment. It that really demonstrated to me that when the undergraduates are doing research with me, it's not just a supplement to what I'm doing. It's actually teaching me something really important. It's contributing to the overall project in a very important way. And I mean, it's not just me. It's like all, all the students in this project, you know? That's right. We have another student. Uh, our good friend Ted. Ted also had a project that he proposed to me that I was unimpressed by. <laughs> um, <laughs> I get to be sometimes this unimpressible guy. Uh, so Ted's interested in Christianity in Okinawa. And I'm thinking to myself, well, see, Okinawa is really famous for a matriarchy-centered, shamanistic religion. And a lot of scholars of, of religion in Okinawa will understand that Buddhism has, has come, and there's uh, sh Japanese Shinto. Um, and, uh, and Christianity comes as well, but none of them see the Christianity sinking any deep roots whatsoever. And you know, there's a history of Americans looking for signs of America in these places, so I'm a little bit skeptical about what Ted's got in mind. Uh, but the rule is, you know, if this is what Ted wants to interview, do, then this is what Ted does. So they changed my mind last summer mm -hmm. when we were in Okinawa together. Uh, you want to tell the story about the Catholic Mass you went to? Yeah, so we go to uh, Catholic Mass on the day of um, an Okinawan festival, mind you. And we show up, and the congregation is half Okinawan, a few Filipinos, a few v Vietnamese, you know, and a large smattering of other people. And there's an Indian priest, and I was like, what? <laughs> and no Americans. Not a single American there, not a civilian, not a military person. And the entire congregation is, I mean, carried out in... Japanese, you know, they don't even say amen, they're, they're using a Japanese word instead. So you're like, how, how does this happen? <laughs> right, so one of the really important things to me, of course, was that, again, when you think about Okinawa, you think about that huge number of American bases, you think of a tiny island with a population that is already fairly large and outsending. You're not necessarily expecting to find a really diverse population from all kinds of parts of the world. It's a small place, why would people be coming from other places to that? Aren't they usually leaving it for somewhere else? And yet the diversity of perspectives and interests that the students bring to the project winds up revealing to us a diversity of perspective, experience, and origins in Okinawa that I had not been anticipating at all. And I probably would have taken a lot longer to find if I ever did. Mm -hmm. So this is just one example. We've got many more stories of other students who have come up with research topics uh, that have really enlightened um, our field of vision about Okinawa. Um, one thing that we want to emphasize about that, of course, is that was planned stuff. We had a lot of serendipity in this, in this project as well. So one of the things we said before is we wanted to be able to find where the photographs were taken so that we could re-photograph in the present and see if we could measure the intensity of change over time from the 1953 photo to the, to the current photo. So here's a photo of uh, Shelby Graham, the gallery director who was first approached taking a shot of a landscape that we were pretty sure is a shot that uh, Charles Gale, the photographer, had taken. But to find these landscapes... It's just a bit of wandering, you know? We got in a car, we drove around the island, we got lost, we got stuck in forests, had some back and out maneuvers, you know? <laughs> right. Holding up the photos in front of landscapes, is that it? Is that it? <laughs> On occasion, we'd actually show the photos to somebody in Okinawa and say, does this look familiar to you? And most of the time, I honestly thought, it can't possibly be identified. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's just, it, I don't know that we'll ever locate it, but a lot of times we found some pretty good hints. Uh, one of the good hints that we got was for this little thing here, which is a pretty interesting, um, it's a small shrine. It's really nothing remarkable in any way. It's stone, that's kind of interesting. Um, and we found it because I had been in a, a gift store for a, um, uh, a tourist uh, location. Um, and I'm trying to show the photographs to the woman who's running the gift store, store um, to see if she recognizes any places. And all she wants to do is sell me something, <laughs> right? So I'm holding a bunch of bills in one hand and my iPad in the other so she'll look at those things. And I'm looking around the room and I see a book on a shelf and it's a book of 300 places of worship in Okinawa. So I reach over there and I grab that and I say, I'll take this please. And she says, why are you buying that? Even Japanese don't buy this thing. <laughs> it's like, well, we're looking for some shrines here and maybe this book will have them and so I'll buy this. And so we keep looking through and then she discovers a photo that makes her stop and she says, I know that. I saw those off the coast when I was a little girl, and we got caught in it. 
Well, we get home and we open up the book and it turns out we find the shrine and here it is in the current day. And we learned a couple of really interesting things and in find First of all, this is a huge, huge thrill. This is one of our first finds, right? So we've gone to Okinawa and we're just struggling. We, can we even find anything? We don't know. We don't have a plan. <laughs> Plans? We're just going to go see what happens. Serendipity is our rule. Mm -hmm. Um, and we find this thing, and it's extraordinary. It's covered in this thick green, and, and uh, but have the to, thing that you find... You have to walk through the forest to get there, you know? It's like a right. long little trek into the... Past these spiders as big as my hand. <laughs> They're gigantic. Um, and, and they live on, on, on webs that can withstand typhoon winds. So just, you bounce off of them. It's a horrible <laughs> thing. Anyway, um, the thing you can't tell in the first photo or this photo is that 50 yards behind us is a major air base. And so again, by finding these things, not only in this case, what we see is a lot more green, but we, we discover, in fact, the transformation of the landscape is right outside the frame. And that was a really important find for us. Um, this was another nice find, yeah. total serendipity. Absolutely. And, and you know the story, I wasn't there. Uh, so, I mean, we just kind of grabbed, got in cars and we'd like driving around, we'd like, there's a certain part of the island that's known for like shallow water. So we're like, okay, most of the pictures look like they're shallow water. What with that tiny boat out there? So we were just kind of driving around, you know, and suddenly we get this phone call excitedly from one of our teammates like, I found it, I found it. And we're like, find what? And he's just like, come here, I'm sending you the, the Google map point. And we show up and it's, and it's that, it's, it's that rock, it's that exact landscape. But, you know, you want to go to this place, you know, it's so beautiful, it's so idyllic. And then it's, I mean, Gotta show them. So uh, <laughs> this is Tommy having found the thing. And, and uh, let me add, this is the daughter of the photographer who he got to take to the, to the island to show her for the first time in her life where her father spent that most important artistic year of his career. So this is Tommy and Jerry having found the hook rock. Uh, <laughs> and it's a great example. One of the things that's so important in this, in this project has been joy. Um, and thrills, uh, to be honest. I mean, that might be enough for me, but we are actually learning a lot more. So we found a lot of places. I think at this point we found about two dozen out of 150 photos. Absolutely. Um, and we've seen a lot of arguments amongst Okinawans about where some of the other things are. Um, always fun arguments. <laughs> um, but there's other things that we need, really, in order for this project to succeed, we have to have Okinawans participate. And so we're going to say a little bit about how we've gotten Okinawan participation in Okinawa. So yeah, um, the pic this picture up here is of one of our teammates. Her name is Lex. Um, she's Okinawan American. So the project for her is a way for her to connect with her family. And connecting with her family has got us some incredible finds. You know, uh, one of our, they've helped us find so many photos, but they have so many stories to tell and share about their time on Okinawa. And it's just been spectacular, you know. And uh, so her family has introduced her and, and many of our team members to lots of other people throughout the island, and it's strengthened our networks, and it's gotten us more contacts, more interviews, more pointers to all kinds of places on the island. And uh, Lex's role in this, in this project has been huge, and she's not the only one with Okinawan heritage, but of course Okinawan heritage is not the only thing that's necessary. Um, the other thing, of course, uh, has been the work of colleagues. Mm -hmm. As we build up these networks, we have relationships with, uh, with academics and students in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. uh, and last summer, in our largest trip to date, we had 28 people go on this trip. Uh, one of our team members was a former TV news announcer on a national broadcasting uh, system in Tokyo. Her name was Kubota Tomoko. Uh, very famous. Everywhere we went in Okinawa, people said, we can't believe you're with, Tomo uh, with Kubota Tomoko. We said, yeah, she's our intern. But as a professional newscaster, Tomoko knew how to use the media. And so she worked the media. Mm -hmm. um, and, she got uh, us nine newspaper articles. Got us in the newspaper nine times. Uh, this is Tomoko on the far left in that upper photo. Uh, we got on TV five times. Yeah. And on the, uh, the radio once. Um, and so you could see a couple of the newspaper articles that, that were about the project that we were doing last summer. And this began to make us, the project, really go big. We got a lot of attention mm -hmm. in Okinawa. Yeah. Um, I mean, we would constantly be marveling at each other, like, we've got to send this home to our parents. Who's going to be in the photo next, you know? Right. <laughs> People were walking up onto the street. We saw you on TV. Yeah. Here's Lex, <laughs> one, of the most, uh, one of the favorite people for the TV. Mm -hmm. Here's Nirupama being photo, uh, videoed up uh, in a far northern part of the island. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. That was, um, 
these old ass photos. And here's another film scene from our most important uh, moment in the whole trip. Mm -hmm. So I had an interview with a newspaper reporter uh, about a week and a half into the trip and told her the whole project. And at the end of the project, at the end of the, uh, the uh, interview, she said, could you give me a couple photos to go along with the newspaper story? So I, I chose photos that I thought would have the best chance of finding somebody who, if they saw the photo, might recognize themselves in it. So I gave her this photo. And the day after the newspaper report came out, the newspaper reporter called me and said, somebody called, she said, I'm the girl in the photo, the girl with the scowl. So the next day we went and we found Arakaki Masako, 74 years old, nine years old at the time, and she's holding up in this cell phone here the oldest picture she had of herself prior to the arrival of the photo from us. Uh, and this became a big newspaper story. We were on the evening news that night. Uh, it was a remarkable thing. So one of the things that happened, of course, is when we've shown this photo to people in the past, lots of people have projected things onto this. This girl looks scared, right? She looks worried. There's some kind of concern here. Maybe she's afraid of the soldier who's taking a photo of her. So the first thing we, and when she called in, she said, I'm the girl in the photo, the one with the scowling face. <laughs> so the first thing we had to ask her was, why the scowl? Were you afraid of the soldier? And she said, I was probably thinking this kid on my back is heavy. <laughs> and and we, we said, is that your younger brother or sister? And she said, I have no idea who that kid is, honestly. <laughs> And, and it turns out that she then told a story about how her father was killed in the Battle of Okinawa. Her mother, of course, now is a single mother raising two kids. Her older brother is 16, old enough now to be off at work. And she's nine years old, living alone in the village. Every day as her mom goes off to work, she just wanders the village. It's nine years after the war is over, and so population is beginning to, to recover. Lots of small babies in the village. If there's a girl in the village or a boy, of her size, who's not carrying a kid on their back, someone's going to put a kid on that back. <laughs> so she's, she told us a story about the burdens of bearing other people's children on her back all day and about how this led to her conversion to Christianity. All kinds of crazy things began to coalesce from all of the different research projects that were going on just in this one interview with Arakaki Masako. This, by the way, is the woman who I was coaxing into telling me something about. Uh, you know, to buy, uh, to buy the book with. <laughs> so you do all kind, everything you can do, right? And, and, and one of the really great things about this is we become unshy. Absolutely. I mean, like <coughs> talking to strangers is like one of the worst things in the world, you know, but um, one of the things is this project just fills you with so much joy and excitement and you just go out on the street and you're like, you, you look old enough. Can you tell me about these photos? <laughs> <laughs> you, you're too young to know this stuff. What do you think? <laughs> This is us interviewing Lex's grandma, the one with her hands up, and her grandmother's older sister, uh, only 92. Only 92, yeah. I think. She's doing uh, wonderful. And uh, you were at that interview. There you are in the, the yeah. far right side. Tell us about that. And it was, it's, it was one of the most interesting experiences to me, mostly because Lex had asked to not be in the interview, so we were doing this without her. And you know, um, Lex's great aunt, who's in the center there, um, she's really like shy about this interview at first. She's like, what do you want to know from me? I'm just an old housewife. All I've done, you know, I'm just... I'm just sitting here, you know? And so she spends most of the, kind of like the start of the interview, she's like really quiet and she won't say anything and she doesn't look at the camera very much. And then by the end of the interview, she's like interrupting her sister, like, get in there, I'm going to tell this story right now. It doesn't matter if they don't understand me. <laughs> you know, and it was this moment of just pure joy of watching someone like light up and be like, my story does matter. People do want to hear it. Students from a random foreign country want to hear my story and think it's important. And that's just... For me, that was one of the moments I was like, wow, this matters. And, and as a teacher, this is the moment when things really began to change. And I, I began to talk to the students about how we've turned on the faucet. We need buckets to catch the water because we're starting to connect with people and they really want to talk to us. And, and now as, as, as somebody who's in the position of, of a teacher, what I'm seeing is that the students are having their subject matters respond to them with passion, right? They can't wait to talk to them. Yeah, I mean, like... And it's so strange because everybody in our project has like deep passions, my friend Owen. Um, and, you know, Owen is interested in land rights and legal documents and laws. And I'm like, Owen, why, why do you care about this? <laughs> and I care, but she didn't. <laughs> what can I say? I'm a big picture kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, 
he had he had a lot of like legal ideas and documents and details in his mind and i hadn't really like thought oh you needed to know more than the fact that the land appropriation had been a big deal that the us bases had taken land from okinawans i thought that's it but we go up to the island we go to talk to one of the original founders of the uh, base resistance movement and she's like oh this is nice some students are coming here to talk to me this is sweet and then owen is like what do you know about the annexation um, annexation tower and there's a village right next to it and there's like 75 people in it right and her face just lights up and she's like wait you know about this <laughs> you know and it was this moment of oh Oh. <laughs> she held you there for like 3 hours. Yeah. I was like, oh this is going to be like a 25 minute talk. We're going to go walk around the rest of the island and there. <laughs> we were there for a very long time. And I might add, this is August in an unconditioned house in Okinawa. Linda, it was like 98 degrees. It was terrible. <laughs> she was a wonderful person. Um so everywhere we go throughout the island as we're showing these photos to people, people are really latching on to them and and I'm really gaining confidence that these resources that we've we've had come to us and that we've started to pull together and making a big difference and one of the things that I'm really noticing here is of course that I've been to Okinawa many times I'm a researcher in Okinawa and I speak uh Japanese I don't speak Okinawan um they're used to seeing me they're happy to work with me but it's a very different thing when they see the students coming along with me so another important thing is happening in this project that makes the research successful and that is that when the students are there with me the people in Okinawa realize that this is not a one-time thing this is a big program building exercise and there's going to be a legacy that's left there's going to be perhaps a long-term relationship to come out of this and this is a photo of three ladies that Nirupama discovered at a museum yeah um we were wandering through the prefectural museum and i'm i'm leaving my group i'm exploring uncharted territory and um i head towards this area and these three women come up to me and they're like what are you doing what what are you up to and i didn't understand them at the time because my japanese was not that great um 2 years ago and lex comes up and she just holds up the photo book and she's like here and immediately they're just like oh and they sit down they take the book straight out of lex's hands and they just kind of like point at them they just like this is my childhood and they talk about all of these things and the nostalgia they argue about like which one of their houses was the worst you know <laughs> and and the one in the middle uh, said to me when i showed up uh you have no idea how intense the pace of change was in our lives and these photos are really bringing that back to us and so crowds gather whenever this comes together like this so last year in this trip the very last 4 days of the trip we had an opportunity to throw together a pop-up exhibition in a uh hallway in the community center in downtown Naha we announced it on the radio about 24 hours before it opened and over the course of 4 days 1200 people came to the exhibit We had a a a 10 week exhibit or 9 week exhibit at the Cessna and we had about 900. Four days 1200 Okinawans came out to this exhibit. And it's just in the hallway in a weird building right above next a to shopping the center. There's a planetarium on one side, a library on the other side, and people are coming out to look at the photos. And when they come out, the first thought they're thinking is, will I be like the girl in the newspaper and find myself in the photo? But when they arrived, they also saw that we had post-it notes and if they knew anything about the photo they we would ask them to write it on the post-it note and put it up next to the photo and so the exhibit hall became this working research laboratory and Okinawans came to find themselves to find their childhood memories but also to tell us what they were seeing in those photos coming with magnifying glasses having posted arguments no it's 300 yards to the left no it's 400 meters to the right <laughs> that kind of thing and many people were coming uh and standing in front of the photos and weeping bringing their grandchildren bringing their children um 50 year old people my age leaning back and saying to me I had no image of what my parents life was like before I was born because we had no photographs everything was destroyed during the war and so there was this profound sense of restoration um uh for them of a visual library for their lives and it was one of the most moving experiences that I've had as a researcher um and as a partner to these students. Yeah. And I mean though it's not just these moments though that are so important like there's so much reciprocity in us working together with Okinawans in these exhibitions but there's also got to be a relationship of gratitude, you know. Um so the person holding the big uh, bouquet here is Kia. He was our head of fundraising team and uh one of our ideas in order to express our gratitude and our respect uh for the people of the island and for what had happened 
um, was to make a thousand paper cranes, you know? Uh, our idea was to have like donor names written on them and uh, give them back to Okinawa in a tangible way beyond just the photos. And, you know, Keir spends a year alone making it. He refuses to let anybody else make the paper cranes. He's like, you won't do it right. Can you teach me how? You can't do it, he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> he's at Harvard Law now. Just, I don't know what that means, but that's where he is. But, you know, uh, at the end of it, we get to tie this thing together and we get to bring it to the Himayori Museum, which is a museum um, that is incredible commemoration of a large, um, a large site for the battle. Um, there was a, lot, a school uh, filled with nurses who were training for the war. Um, they were drafted into the battle, and a lot of them passed away. All but 13 of them died. Yeah. So it was a, it was a big it's devastation. It's a moving sight. Um, but we were really grateful to be able to go there and give this to them and hopefully start a functioning relationship that is reciprocal. Right. So this leads us to the, to the final uh, import of all of this. We, we, we're learning something about the post-war uh, of Okinawa. We're learning a lot of things about the, the, the transformation in people's lives. But Okinawa is also a place that is, is becoming increasingly um, assertive about its potential role in a global peace movement. That uh, for many years in Japan particularly, Hiroshima and Nagasaki stood at the forefront of a peace movement because Hiroshima and Nagasaki represented the possibility of future wars to us, right? And thankfully that's never happened again. But Okinawans say the battle that happened to us continues to happen today. And if you want to think about war and if you want to think about actually resisting um, the future of war, you need to think about what happened in Okinawa. And so because of that, Okinawans have become very uh, interested in um, forging broad global um, relationships for, uh, for peace studies and whatnot. Um, and one of the things that you're hearing about Okinawa these days, for example, is about the construction of a base up in the north in a place called Henoko. So there's a Marine Corps air station that uh, is being constructed, um, and it's being built across this uh, peninsula here. And the idea is that they're going to do land. They've built a retaining wall here. There's going to be landfill here. And you can kind of see a line along the edge here that shows where the other side of the retaining wall can go. And they're going to fill in on both sides and create a landing strip. Now, for the Okinawans who live in this area, this is one of the most vibrant coral reefs in the island. Um, and the destruction of the coral reef will represent to them the loss of a potential future that is based on a kind of ocean diversity. And so as we go to Okinawa to study this past, we're also winding up having a deep engagement with the struggles that Okinawans have in the present. Uh, and this is us, again, Nirupama uh, in the photo here, at the site of protest around the, the base construction. Um, and so we wind up uh, learning a lot, not just about that past, but about the present. Mm -hmm. of and about the what they feel the future of Okinawa is going to be. And of course, what this means is that uh, we're seeing that Okinawa is a really big place. Uh, and actually, we have, here's the slide I wanted to have. <laughs> um, Okinawa is an important base complex, but if you think about it, Okinawa is one of a lot of base complexes around the world. Um, and you, you can have any stance that you want on whether the base complexes around the world are necessary or not, but I do think that not many Americans have a, very much of a consciousness of the bases themselves unless they have any relationship with military families. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in, in doing this research on Okinawa, we're thinking about a much bigger picture, which is about the bases around the world. So there's one other way. The last thing I'll say about the, the, base, the, uh, the project here is that Okinawa, as we mentioned before, is an outsending country for much of its history. Um, and so one of the things that we want to be doing now, now that we're seeing such a great response from Okinawans, is we want to be going to the places of Okinawan diaspora and meeting with the people um, who live in those places and showing the photos to them and talking with them about their experiences, their relationship to Okinawa, their post-war histories as well. And we're going to do that by traveling this working exhibition to all these places. So that means going to Okinawa, but it means going to Osaka and Yokohama. It means going to Honolulu. It means going to Los Angeles and to San Diego. It means going to Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, because it turns out that a huge number uh, of the uh, Japanese Brazil Brazilians are actually from Okinawa. Uh, and it means going to uh, a place called Colonia Okinawa in central Bolivia, outside a town called Santa Cruz, where in 1956 the American military resettled 8,000 Okinawans whose land had been appropriated for base construction and who still reside in Bolivia today. And so our goal is to go to all of these places. And this is where the project gets ridiculous. 
Because who would have imagined when we first got these photos, right, Stella? Did you think we were going to go to Brazil? Um, it didn't seem possible that a bunch of undergraduates working with, uh, with a professor and some staff and other people would decide that this is where we had to go, but this is where we had to go. Mm -hmm. And so this is how the project is uh, playing out. Excuse me. Uh, this is our future. It's going to be happening for another five, six, seven, eight years. If you're thinking about coming to Santa Cruz and this sounds interesting to you, consider joining us. Uh, we also took a trip with some alumni and friends of the project uh, last summer where we managed to survive the heat. We're doing another trip for, uh, for friends, supporters, and alumni in March of 2020 this year. So the temperature will be a little bit better. If you're interested in that, please join us in that as well. And otherwise, we have uh, time for questions with Jody. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we want to uh, have you ask the question with the microphone. Can we take the spots down a little bit so that we can see who we're talking to? Thank you so much. So I saw a hand up, up here. I just have a question. Have you read the book from Okinawa to the Americas? No, I haven't read that one. Okay, it's a great. Uh -oh. uh, you, no, <laughs> found it's, it's okay. It's our family friend's mother oh, who was okay. from Okinawa, uh -huh. who went to Peru. Oh, and yes. she was, my father <laughs> said that his friend always kidded. She was one of the first well, to cross into California illegally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from yeah. South America. Yeah, no, there's a, I'd forgotten to mention Peru as well uh, as a possible destination. It's, it's uh, and, and of course that passage from Latin America into North America is, is a common one. Mexico is another place. Cuba is another place. So yeah, thank you for the recommendation. Hi, this is phenomenal. <laughs> and um, and it sounds like a really good example of what you were talking about. There are 20,000 students there. So what are the other opportunities for something like this that you know starts from a photograph and ends up in the hu this huge project? Well, I think we have to talk about students in the STEM fields, which mm -hmm. you know hasn't really been our topic tonight. But um, last summer, I had the opportunity to take uh, my own child um, who's 16, out to Año Nuevo Island, right off of Año Nuevo Reserve. Um, and the island is, is inhabited by sea lions, elephant seals, and um, undergraduate, graduate student, and faculty researchers, <laughs> and a lot of seagulls. Um, and that has been an example for me of, and I tried to also talk about some other examples, maybe not sustained multi-year projects, but uh, but I really feel that the campus is moving towards trying to make sure that all of our students have an opportunity for experiential learning. And we have not done that uh, thoroughly until now. But I think this is kind of what I was trying to get at about how the history placement and present movements in higher education are making us much more nimble than many of our colleagues around the country at being able to make these opportunities possible. So for instance, we've just applied for a, or reapplied for a very large NSF grant called Petalos, which would make sure that all first year students had at least some opportunity to do learning on the living laboratory that is the campus. And that's not just ecological learning. There's a project as part of Petalos to teach math out in the living laboratory of the campus in the hopes that that can help people who have math anxiety to actually see what can you do with math, right? It's not just a bunch of numbers on a board. So I think, you know, we're really, um, there are lots of education grants that are being written right now that support experiential learning. And as the director of the CITL, I get to have my name on many of those, even though I'm, I'm not centrally involved in their deployment. So I think there's more and more opportunities like that. Um, micro internships are a really popular topic nationally right now. And I use that example of the, of the data 
um, having students in our engineering school go into community organizations and do micro projects for them because maybe they can't afford to hire somebody to collect a data set, analyze it, or produce a visualization for their fundraising. But we have students who can do that and you know it doesn't require them to take a whole course or quit their job that they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So I think we're trying to have these deep learning experiences that are concentrated for our students because our students want, many of our students want to double major. Many of our students want to get out as fast as they can because it's expensive to go to Santa Cruz. So we're trying to figure out how to embed experiential learning opportunities for those students who have more pressures on them in terms of time and, and time to degree, even as people like Alan and his team are producing these multi-year expansive projects. Mm -hmm. And I also think that, um, you know, like a lot of classes bring out a lot of questions from people because of the way that teachers are teaching, you know. And if you're left with a question after a class, um, there are a lot of research opportunities and um, scholarship opportunities like uh, the, correct, the Correct Scholars Program. Yeah. Um, so that gives you, gives you like $2,000 um, to work on it for a quarter or two quarters and really pull out research to make it go further. So even if you're not particularly or directly linked to a big research project, you can pursue your own and there's a lot of campus support for it. One of my favorite things about being provost is I have a, uh, a undergraduate research uh, pool of money and every quarter students can apply to, uh, to my pool of money to do research. And I had a, a group of uh, students who were working on uh, the bee colony um, collapse pr question and they had a question about uh, bee mites and uh, they came for $500 for me and I gave them $500 but I put them in touch with an organic farmer in Watsonville who gave them another $1,000 to do their research and so as a, as a, uh, a provost you have interesting connections to alumni to the community and to the students and so they can do them they can do them ridiculously big and they can do them small and they can all be meaningful Well, I had a question about the Okinawa project. I wondered to what extent um, you have discovered in your interviews and in your researches the sense of um, where Okinawans stand as other in relation to the rest of Japan, um, mm -hmm. you know, to the extent that they are a bit of a crossroads. And then following on that, I wondered um, what is the indigenous makeup of Okinawa, are they, you know, the current, you could look at currents, is it like a Malacca of the earlier period? And I, I wondered how much of that came out in the self-identity and, you know, discourse. I mean, the, the interviews that you... Sure. You, you want to start with that, Nancy? Yeah. So we didn't get to particularly touch on um, uh, Ryukyuan national identity, but um, yeah, I mean, many, many Okinawans feel that they are separate from the Japanese, you know. They were, until the 1800s, not part of Japan. So they only became properly annexed into Japan's cultural um, sphere um, during the um, rapid imperialist period. Um, so I think that there is a lot of, there's a lot of conflict on the island. There's a lot of identity conflict. Lex often speaks to me about the way that um, she deals with indigeneity and what it means to be indigenous, you know, and um, we've had a lot of conversations with um, half Okinawans who also have this constant struggle of what does it mean to be both oppressor and oppressed? What does it mean to be in straddling that intersection? And, you know, there's this constant idea and question of how my, does my indigeneity, what does it define about me? Does this identity define me? Can I straddle beyond those boundaries? So, you know, there's just so many interesting, amazing things that we've been hearing from people. You know, to what extent um, the mental health or the, mm -hmm. you know, inherited, um, certainly to be militarily in some sense colonized. Sure. And in that way, that's so interesting. You know, I'm ja of Japanese descent. Right. And, um, my family is from Kyoto and from uh -huh. Hiroshima, uh -huh. so and Tokyo. Right. Uh, but it's so interesting to think about Okinawa, small as it is, right. as this microcosm and, right. in a way, an example of even American military um, imperialism or or colonization right. in the way that how does identity play in that. Well, I, I think two things quickly about what you've just said now. And one is that this is, it's a really good question that 
illustrates why it's important to me that it's not just history students who participate in this project, although we're looking at a historical period. So we've had environmental studies students. We've had um, students in psychology, psych majors, um, computer science majors. Um, we call them our computer nerds, and they sit in the corner and they do a lot of stuff for us. It's really important. They travel with us as well. Um, uh, and we have lots of fun. But all, it's not just the, it's a variety of different perspectives. And the psych uh, students are bringing some really interesting things to us about um, discourses on PTSD mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, the perdurance of a sense that the war never ended in Okinawa because the bases remain. Um, and uh, so that's, that's a really important thing that, that we're picking up there um, in Okinawa as well. O Okinawans have what I would call today a kind of cosmopolitan nationalism. So their nationalism is one that identifies themselves as distinct from the Japanese, distinct, of course, from the Americans. But it's also one that, that rejects a notion of a kind of exclusivity. Mm -hmm. They hearken back to an age, a golden age, of Okinawa as a seafaring, entrepot-trading nation. Not a conquering nation, but a, sh a, a nation that carried trade mm -hmm. throughout Southeast Asia, from India through Southeast Asia to China. And they see that as the model of what an, of what a, a, an Okinawan identity in the future could be. Uh, one in which the Okinawans embrace the world and embrace the world to come to them. Mm -hmm. Which is why, again, when I think about the Catholic mass story that, that Nirupama told from Ted's tour as a, a, a really great sign of what Okinawan discourse about identity can mean today. So it looks like we only have time for one more question. I wonder if any of our prospective students have anything they'd like to ask us. Yeah. We'll tell you anything. <laughs> Um, hi, so uh, it seems like at um, the college there are a lot of many different amazing research opportunities. Um, so my question is, um, uh, through the college, what sort of systems, if any, are put in place so that students can become aware that these opportunities are accessible to them? And then um, any ways that the, the college serves to support students that are taking on those research opportunities on top of sort of everyday academics um, and things like that? Yeah, so, um, I, you know, largely research opportunities like these are made uh, visible to students within the major. So mostly you would pursue something like this within the major. So for instance, it always blows me away, but every single student who majors in environmental studies does an internship. Some of these are paid, some of them are unpaid. Students can kind of figure out what works for them, their situation. And there are various funds that you can apply to if you can't afford to do one of these deep learning situations. So financial aid extends to some of them, it doesn't extend to others, but we're becoming much better about making sure that these opportunities are available to all of our students. Um, yeah, so I think that's the, the two parts. There are also, you know, we, I've been researching, there's a, there's a new, um, it's a kind of a micro internship matching program. It's kind of like Tinder for micro internships, <laughs> uh, where anyone in the community who wants someone to do a micro internship can post it on this, and then the students can go and match with them. And I've been thinking about, this is the kind of wide ranging stuff that I get to do in my job, which is so crazy. Two years ago, I was a professor of 17th century English poetry uh, and rarely <laughs> picked my head up out of you know John Donne and John Milton. Um, but thinking about whether we could bring something like that to campus um, so that not only were people who needed an intern uh, putting a micro internship, but students who had a particular skill could put that skill out in a community organization or you know, corporation or something could say, oh, I need a student who can do that thing, right? So I think we're getting a lot better at matching these um, paracurricular learning opportunities um, for our students and making sure that we're not forgetting uh, the students who maybe need to have a paid internship or, um, you know, can't do a field course because the overhead fees for field courses are higher. There's a, I'm going to make a quick correction to, to Keith and Nirupama. The College Scholars Program is not just at Cal. It's at, it, it's half the colleges have a fall start. All the colleges have a spring start. And, and many of the prospective students here today may have received an invitation to the College Scholars Program as well. And one of the things that the College Scholars Program does is through the first year, it puts you into constant contact with professors from around the campus to learn about the research that they're doing. Um, and it gives you opportunities to meet with them face to face and perhaps even ask them, could I join your lab? Do you have any opportunities for me in your field? You could be in some other part of the campus, but you might wind up working in 
uh, Sri Kriniawan's uh, virtual reality lab, for example. And really, I mean, for those of you who do come, the one piece of advice that I would give you is that if you think you might like to do something like the kinds of things that we've been talking about tonight, don't wait for somebody to make a database. Right? You have to reach out and make human connections. Ask your provost, ask your advisors, ask your departmental staff. If you want to study elephant seals, find out, how do I get in touch with Dan Costa and become the elephant seal person? <laughs> right? Actually, he might be the sea lion person. Don't tell anybody. I just got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but you see what I mean? You know, you, you really can take the initiative, and I don't think anyone's going to say, oh, no, I refuse to connect you with that resource. Yeah. So do follow, follow your instincts towards things that you might want to do, and it's a campus that will open doors for you. Mm -hmm. It can be really scary, but like pretty much every single professor that I've talked to has been incredibly welcoming, incredibly open to sharing that, that research and incredible, like, in a way of talking to you and helping you figure out what you want to do, so. And on that note, thank you to our panel. <laughs> and uh, just a, a plug that uh, a year from now, in March 2020, Alan's doing another uh, tour for alumni, parents, and friends. You're welcome to join. And uh, we have cookies and coffee out in the patio to continue the conversation. Thank you for coming. <laughs>